The Green Crow Inn, a novel by Derek A. Camon, read by Kelman Friedman. Chapter 17 Good Yule If one were to examine a map of the continent, the North Continent, I should say, though that hardly needs expressing, as there are no maps of the South Continent, one would note that Nawari is of roughly the same northerliness as the capitals. Certainly, this region between the capitals and Gindi lands is a tad more to the north, but not by much, not enough to explain the bitter winter. For while I believed winter was well and truly present, the chill air and pleasant sunshine of the past two weeks left as if it had been forcefully evicted and the actual Nawari winter presented itself with frightening splendor. The air was not so much colder than the winters of Callaheim, and yet it bit harder somehow. One night after dinner, Carmichael and Pram came to the Crow for an evening mug, and I chose to linger around them more than I normally would have. They seemed a bit put out that I'd gone to Gilly for more tutelage, as if my doing so was a slight to their teaching methods, so I'd been avoiding them. Yet I hoped to catch Pram offering some folksy aphorism about this being a colder-than-normal winter. She said no such thing. My own comments, such as, My, is it cold? were met with only shrugs and non-answers from them. Sumi and Gilrad were a little help either. I did not ask Kalka about the weather. I did not ask her about much of anything. Our interactions became increasingly more brief and businesslike as my tenure at the Green Crow Inn drew to a close. The time for the new year approached swiftly, and my preparations for the party gained momentum to match. Word of mouth was the primary thing, and so all who passed through the doors of the inn were made repeatedly aware of our celebrations. "'We know!' shouted Skivrin a week into my campaign. He was taking his leave of the common room with a few other dads, and as irritable as usual. I was genuinely concerned for his mood, but never managed to find out where his anger came from. "'I'll be busy that night anyway,' he added. Then he turned and spoke loudly so that the whole inn could hear. We will venture forth to bring a special blessing to the people of Nuari. I knew without looking that Kalka, behind the bar, had rolled her eyes. Elgad was there among his paternal sleep-deprived cohorts. He winked and patted my shoulder kindly. We'll be there. Reckon I'll bring Ilma as well. I smiled weakly. I'd all but given up on asking them about the Red Cloak, so why bother inquiring after Skivron's special venture? I thought I might have left some weeks ago, Nayergi declared, but then I thought, why not stay on just a bit longer for this event? It should be quite the celebration. At that, Sumi sighed, perhaps wishing to have been rid of the old prying dwarf sooner. I noted our parallel situations yet again, for she had noticeably kept her distance from him as I had done with Carmichael and Pram. Shatan nodded with a smile. We wouldn't miss it, she said. I would said Isru. "'But you won't,' put in her sister. Isru immediately retreated to the cellar. She was well beyond trying to hide her departures now. Gilly and Luella ate their breakfast in quiet companionship as I explained things. "'You know I know, Torson,' said Gilly. "'Yes, just offering a reminder, I suppose,' I blushed. "'What is it now?' a full-mouthed Luella asked honestly. I won't miss your party for all the world, stated Ivor the minstrel with a theatrical lift of his hand. I haven't said anything, Ivor, I replied. He sighed, and his hand fell. Next came a letter-writing offensive. This proved far more difficult, as paper was not so simple to come by, and my hand cramped easily. In my room, having no desk, I stood over the dresser one evening, scribbling away in a large script about the date and time of the event. I must have been muttering, was definitely cursing, when, at the edge of my vision, I noticed Furrier lingering at the door. Since his... incident, our cellarer had become quiet and reserved. His demeanor could have been best described as odd and unnecessarily confrontational before, but at least he was jovial. Now I thought his aim was to outpace me in raw sulkiness. We'd had few exchanges, and those strictly about operations. It was easier on my nerves, and yet I missed his japes and insults. At least he was, unsurprisingly, confiding in Sumi kind. I had seen them speaking together soberly a few times, and so to have the troll approach me was unexpected. Perhaps approach is too strong a word. He leered at me. Unable to endure the discomfort of his stare, I spoke up. 
Some traders are staying the night. Said they'd take a few of these with them, so I've got to get this done. Guests from beyond Nawari may be a long shot, but hopefully their towns are as uneventful, and so a New Year's party worth the journey. Furrier sucked his teeth. The traders were a loose confederation of vagrants, adventurers, and merchants. They went this way and that, and never stopped for very long. They always had tall tales to share, though most did not take them seriously. The set visiting the crow happened to be heading to Borncleft in the morning. I shook my poor writing hand. Give it here, he grumbled. Oh, the letters. Why? So's I can write them, you prat. Trolls know their letters. I coughed a laugh as an attempt to ensure he knew I was joking. Furrier frowned and held out his hand, and so I gave him the stack of paper with an exemplar on the top. He left silently. Right, I muttered. Next morning, I stumbled downstairs yawning. My hand touched the knob of the rear door, ready to brave the cold and make my way to the stable. Then, I stopped inside. The horses were now under the dutiful eye of Gilrad, and I need not bother. The silhouette of the stable was wobbly through the window pane, doubly so against the burning orange dawn. I stared sadly and wondered how the horses were doing. Let's see if Sumi needs help, I muttered to the world in general. The search led me to the common room, which smelled of black tea and fire smoke. The traders, six in total, rose to leave. There was a dwarf, a troll, and four men. My palm struck my forehead. The letters, I groaned. One of the traders, a squat man and appointed cowl, heard me and turned in my direction. Yep, he called, and held up a twined collection of paper. My eyebrows nearly touched when I furrowed them. Let me see that. I snatched it aggressively in my drowsy state, but added a quick, Sorry. The trader appeared annoyed. What I held was probably the finest hand lettering I'd ever seen. Right there, in plain black ink, was all the information I'd requested. New Year's festivities abound, specially brewed wintertide lager, fun for the whole family, etc. The script was irrefutably gorgeous. I looked up to see Furrier standing in the doorway to the courtyard, and I smiled at him. I could see his yellow eyes dart to the other troll, who did not notice him. Then Furrier turned and went outside without acknowledging me. Coming back to myself, I handed the papers to the trader. Thank you very much indeed, I said. The trader nodded and waved his hand in a circular gesture. The rest of his troop downed their drinks and made for the door, all of them dressed in brown leather overcoats with fur trimming. The quiet din of their conversation faded away, along with the sound of their feet crunching through the snow, and I was left alone in the common room to tidy up. All that week was a flurry of activity. More letters were sent, sometimes by an unexpected trader and sometimes by courier. Our resident cellarer turned scribe seems to enjoy having the work to do, so I spent more of my meager wages than I would have liked on additional paper and ink. I went as often as I could to the center square of Nuwari and told anyone who would listen to me about the event, even if it was their third time hearing it. More than a few were getting annoyed with me, but I found I did not mind ignoring them. The little tree Blet had given me, my pet, as Sumi called it, flourished in its new home. Its clean branches stood out proudly and the verdant pine needles took an even richer green luster. I'd no idea why. In fact, I was quite terrified that I was mistreating the poor little thing, giving it only a little water and a dash of compost. Perhaps the prayers of the beambacks nourished it. I set it in the dead center of the common room. If she disagreed with the positioning, Kalka did not tell me. After I placed it and Sumi strung it with a garland of holly flowers, the innkeeper saw the tree, nodded, and went on about her business. From the balcony, clear across the tavern to the front door, we strung more holly garlands, lights, and whatever pine boughs we could gather. Every single table, and the bar, we adorned with more of the same so that two days before the eve of the new year our common room looked like a magical place, all green and crimson, given an ethereal mood by the light of red candles courteously donated by Ilna. The functionality of the string lights, hung in an X from corner to corner over the tavern, remained a mystery to me. Sumi attempted an explanation, comparing them to the glowworm lamps that many dwarf homes use in the world below ground, but still it made no sense. There were no creatures inside the bulbs as far as I could see. Next day, a mere rising and setting of the sun before our event, I went by Gillies for a final inspection of the wintertide lager. Her home was even more wondrous in the snow somehow. A few of the paintings had been changed out, and now one hung over the hearth depicting the king. His ochre skin glistened unnaturally, as shiny as the circlet on his head. 
and he was surrounded in a rough circle by his advocates. These were diminutive and hooded figures who, if the rumors were correct, lived their lives unnamed and unseen. I pointed at the image. Your own original? Gilly chuckled charmingly. No, I've not much artistic talent. Can't recall where I found that one. Must have been some years ago, as he's no longer such a young man. You've seen the king recently? Gilly nodded, still smiling. When last I was in the capitals, he gave a public address. What about? She tapped her chin and thought. Hmm, I don't recall. Anyways, tomorrow's the day, eh? Let's check on your brew. The large cask of my lager rested in the kitchen. It seemed comfortable, if inanimate objects could be comfortable. Burned onto its side were the words, Green Crow Inn Wintertide Lager, in fine lettering. Delicate, curling lines enclosed the words, and a bird was there in the corner, wings outstretched. My smile was undeniable. Now this is your handiwork. Gilly raised her hand briefly and said, Guilty as charged. Shall we? My host produced two dimpled glass mugs and winked at me. Glass could be hard to come by, so it was unusual for a private home to keep such items. Most folk used plain ceramic cups. I should not have been surprised that Gilly kept glass in her supply, of course, nor that she would offer them on special occasion. She poured masterfully, and soon we each held half a pint capped with a perfect layer of foam. "'Your health, sir,' she said. The lager was crisp and refreshing, as all lagers should be, and the clean taste of hoppy grain was pleasant. Juniper slid by as an aftertaste, subtly but clearly. Were the imbiber not expecting it, they may not detect it as juniper exactly, but merely as a fine and unexpected end to an agreeable mouthful. I was satisfied. Gilly exhaled. Not bad. Best we get it out of here before I drink it all, eh? I had little doubt that Gilly could polish off an entire keg of beer, so I took her joke seriously. It was to our advantage, then, that I came prepared. Muffin, newly returned from her retreat, was on loan from Pram. Apparently, the farmer had forgiven me for the perceived betrayal, and asked Muffin to be good, for the little horse was waiting patiently outside for us in spite of the cold. I cleared the wagon and lowered the gate, then returned a moment later at the fore of the keg. Gilly grunted on the other side. We deposited the cask carefully, but not without force, and when the wagon shuddered, so did Muffin, emitting a quiet wicker of surprise. Gilly patted her on the rump. "'Reckon I should follow behind, lest any bumps want to send your beer to a bad end,' Gilly offered and tied a scarf around her head. "'Have you got the time?' I asked courteously. She shrugged. "'Luella's working. What else am I going to do?' The crunching of snow under wagon wheel accompanied us all the way back to the crow. The final leg of the journey, going round to the back of the inn from the driveway, proved the deadliest. But Gilly kept the cask steady. Gilrad popped his head out of the stable doors. "'Come and help?' asked Gilly. He shook his head and gestured towards nothing in particular. Then he went back into the stables. This little distraction gave me just enough time to notice that as many mounts as usual were in the stable. I had expected, or at least hoped for, a flood of guests the day before our party. I frowned, and Gilly, sensing my disappointment, patted me on the back. We were both shivering, but chatting happily when we entered the mudroom. "'Ah, furrier!' I cried. "'What luck!' "'Will you help us bring in the beer, please?' The cellarer grimaced, but complied with neither quip nor insult. It goes without saying that bringing the overlarge container of beer went more smoothly with a troll on our side. Gilly hardly needed to apply herself, but directed us up the back of the stairs, through the mudroom, and into the kitchen. "'Carefully, carefully,' she said. Furrier sighed. Once deposited, we stretched our backs, and Gilly, perhaps inspired by the sounds of discourse coming from the common room, called for a celebratory drink. "'Bit early,' muttered Furrier. Gilly winked at him and vanished through the door. He sighed once more, then looked at me. "'Visitor here for you.' "'Oh, really?' I frowned. "'Who is it?' Rather than answer me, Furrier descended downstairs to the cellar. All at once I was terrified and excited. My visitor could prove an enemy. No doubt Furrier would enjoy some small revenge for sending me into such company without warning.' It could be no one at all, if he were back to his usual pranks. Or it could be Nandaya. The actuality was somewhere in between, for the visitor was neither enemy nor welcomed guest. Son! It was my father. 
The very second I had made my egress from the kitchen, I saw him. He stood up immediately, rising from his seat like a shot, the tails of his long coat flopping down to his sides, his curly salt and pepper hair shifting with motion. His arms went up, and he cried out again, Torson! And a smile split his face. Kalka turned and looked at me. She'd been sitting with him, apparently nursing a cup of tea. Her face bore no readable expression. Sumi was behind the bar, looking on with concern. The rest of the midday crowd, just two tables of mixed company, went on about their business. As if to add insult to injury, I again noted the normalcy of the crowd. Were there any here, especially for tomorrow's event, they were small in number. Father, I murmured and forced a smile. I believed I could walk across the room without my heart leaping out of my chest, though it was difficult. My father met me halfway and crushed me in a hug. My son, he sighed, then gestured for me to sit at the table. Beard's coming in nicely, isn't it? My poor heart leapt again. As I sat, sliding into the comfortable wooden chair beneath me, I saw the brooch I had stolen resting on the table in front of Kalka, who was watching me carefully. The thing leered at me, half a sphere with curious markings. I ran my hand over my face. Arn here, Kalka said quietly with a gesture towards my father, was just telling me he'd heard about our little party tomorrow. B but that's Im impossible. H how? I stammered. My father laughed and stirred his tea. I've lots of deliveries and sales agents and the like coming and going from our stores. A pair of such contractors made mention of this place on their debriefing. Most curious of all was that, at least it seemed to me, this inn, he grinned sterilely at Kalka, as charming as it is, would have gone without real notice had they not lost this bit of jewelry here. Arne picked up the brooch and admired it, twisting it in his hand with interest. I've no idea what it is, but this little thing, and their description of the busser, now he turned his eyes to me, burned the name Green Crow into my mind. So when a pack of traders crossed paths with me, talking about some celebration or other at the turn of the year, I had to come and see for myself. His eyes remained locked with mine as he continued. Your mother has been so worried, Torson. I felt myself blush and clench my jaw, and I wished the world would disappear. You are done with this place, are you not? Again Arn looked at Kalka with that fake smile. Lovely, as it is. I cleared my throat. My eyes darted from Kalka to the hearth to my father and back again. The innkeeper was as unreadable as ever. I suppose I am, I said in a reedy voice. Right, cried my father. That is well, and fortunate. Yarman has lined up a wonderful entry-level position for you at his enterprise. Very good, I said quietly, looking at nothing. A few moments of bumbling silence ensued. Kalka stared at me. Arn sipped his tea and made a quality attempt at looking serene when he was clearly feeling as uncomfortable as the rest of us. The table in the corner cleared out, waving at Sumi as they left. The cold, wet air dealt us a blow as they opened and closed the door. Well, father couldn't handle the moment any longer. He rose, and as his coat flopped down to his sides once more, he smoothed his waistcoat, checked his pocket chain, and primmed his mustache. Riding through the night does take it out of one, as they say. Room 17, you said? Kalka nodded. I'll see you shortly, then. Good Yule to you both. And with another well-practiced smile, he nodded and departed for his room. The innkeeper watched him leave. I don't care for him, she said flatly. I found that all I could do was shrug. Then I, too, stood and prepared for the rest of my duties on this, the second to last, day in her employ. Kalka sat back comfortably. You tolerate his nonsense more than you tolerate mine. If I had said something like that, you'd have fought me. Without looking at her, I replied, You don't hold twenty-odd years' worth of domineering memories in my mind, now do you? She nodded with what I thought to be a sad expression on her face. I guess not. Once his mind is made up, you have to comply. Or run. Kalka clapped her hands together casually and stood up. Now you've done both. I guess. I looked around the tavern once more and noted sadly... This no has been here. The Green Crow Arm. Inn by Derek A. Kamal, read by Kalman Friedman, with music by Michael Elliott. To find out more, including how to purchase your copy of the novel, please visit shorelessskies.com.